the things that are absolutely key to making you happy are your relationships with the people you deal with on a day-to-day basis. Business of Architecture, episode 403. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that empowers you to do your best work more often. The podcast, of course, is sponsored by Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy for architects that helps you structure your practice and your teams for freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Our interview today is with Bruce Hayden, co-founder of Human Studio, a design and architecture firm based in Vancouver, Canada. In his work as an architect, Bruce saw a problem. He found that he often lacked hard metrics and data to inform or at least justify design decisions. As a result, he found that clients ultimately and frequently base their decisions on more hard and measurable data like construction cost. But how do we quantify or calculate some of the more intangible elements of design? And more importantly, how do we justify these costs or these expenditures to clients who are ultimately footing the bill? As a result of his inquiry, Hayden developed and spearheaded the design of a software application called Fluid Sociability that measures the sociability of buildings and spaces, and more on that in this episode. Ultimately, this is a story that lies at the heart of what it means here at Business of Architecture, the business of architecture. In other words, the business of architecture is simply this. When you have an important message and a mission, when you have value to give to the world, how do you get the opportunity to make that impact? How do you take an idea? How do you vet that idea? How do you then find the funding or the ability or the resources to bring that idea to the world? And then how do you then make it visible and help it have an impact? This is ultimately about the story of the business of architecture. So super excited for this interview with Bruce Hayden. Ponder that question and more as we jump into today's conversation with Bruce Hayden. Hello, Bruce, and welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you, Enoch. What is Fluid Sociability? Let's start there. Fluid is a software tool that we've built with the support of uh, the Robert Johnson Foundation, which is an amazing, the largest private funder of public health initiatives in the United States. And our goal with Fluid is to really bring evidence-based design, evidence-based tools to really understand building sociability before we build the buildings. Beautiful. And help us understand, when you say building sociability, define that for us, please. We measure three things uh, with a diminished degree of confidence. The first thing we measure is what we call encounters. So it uses, uh, just to, to set the stage a little bit, it uses what I sometimes describe as, as gaming, gaming technology, um, which is the, the term of art is, is agent-based modeling. So we have a 3D digital model and uh, that people move around the building and, and interact with each other. Out of those interactions, we measure three things. We measure encounters, which we define as simply the physical opportunity for a social interaction. So if you and I are running into a coffee, run into each other in a coffee shop, you know, if we have the opportunity to have eye contact with each other within a certain frame of distance, we just call that an encounter. So because that's the kind of the, the simplest way to think about it is that if you don't have that opportunity, then we can't have any kind of social interaction, right? Because we're talking about in person, we're not talking about digital interactions. Um, Second, we measure greetings, which is exactly what it sounds. So you and I can have an encounter, which sets the stage for a potential for you and I to say hi to each other. And it could be as simple as a wave. It could be as simple as a, as a hi. Um, and third, we measure conversations. And conversations, again, are exactly what, what, uh, what they say. And now, in terms of the way we've structured the software and the kind of theoretical background, we're quite confident about encounters. We have a medium level confidence about greetings and conversations is kind of out there a bit. We're guessing a bit. So Bruce, let's take a step back. I want to really set the stage here. Can you talk to me about the problems that you were setting out to, to solve? There was, there was some impetus here. Absolutely. I, I'm gonna, I, I like to tell the story of, uh, of uh, when I was at my previous firm, I was, work, I was leading the design of a small branch library with social housing for women above it. 
And in many cases, these were single mothers. And in some cases, they were women fleeing violence, um, uh, long-term housing, not transitional housing. And the way that it's a street front site, about a hundred, you know, about a hundred, hundred feet by hundred feet. Let's call it in round numbers. And we knew that social interaction was going to be absolutely critical to the quality of life of these women and their kids. I think it's critical to all of us, by the way, but in this particular case, even more so. The traditional way that we were, we were in the end, had to lay this out was we had a strip of units facing the main street, we had a corridor, and we had a C-shaped block of units facing the other way. What we call the traditional double-loaded corridor scenario that almost, almost all of your listeners, I'm sure, will be familiar with. We did many options, though, and one of them was a courtyard model. And the courtyard model was a kind of stacked townhouse model. And in simple terms, the most important thing about it is when any of the women was stepping out of the front door of the unit, they would see something like 70% of the other units, 70% of the other front doors of the units. So their opportunity for just day-to-day -day social interaction, who's going where, what's going on, was absolutely going to be much higher than the double-loaded corridor scenario. But the measurable difference was that the courtyard model had about 25% extra wall area which we knew was, at least on one level, it doesn't always work this simply, going to increase, I call it the baseline construction cost and the baseline maintenance cost. So we had a measurable cost data point and a soft social value. My experience is very straightforward, is that when you have a measurable data point going up against a soft data point, and sociability is almost always a soft data point, sociability loses. And I thought, I want to stop losing this game. Mm, mm. And I'm guessing, had you lost that game in the past or what was that like? Um, I, I, I've lost it many times. And in part, um, obviously, we're not suggesting that all clients should value sociability. But, um, you know, if you one of the other ways I think about this work is, um, in my early stages of my career, the green building movement was really in its infancy. Um, the way people thought about green building was very loose. I, uh, solar panels and non-toxic paint and you're done. You've got a green building. And then there were a whole series of different pieces of work to really start to quantify in a real way what is the impact of construction and design on the environment. And you can be critical of things like LEED, and I am. Um, but they, they, they moved the dial. They basically said, this is something we must consider. And I think the critical tool is, is, um, is that, that measurable data. And we also know that in, so often in sociability, we use precedent studies, we do, um, you know, which are important. But nobody has said, you know, let's actually see what happens if we have kind of fake people moving around buildings. Let's start to understand that in a much more visceral way. So that's, it sounds, it's a salient problem. I get that. And you didn't, so it sounds like what you found, which we found also is generally that the soft data points would lose out to some of the hard metrics, especially when it comes to construction cost. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah, it sounded like for you, it was a bit of a journey of arming yourself, so to speak, with the tools to be able to have some harder data regarding some of these things that haven't been measured in the past, like the sociability. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And I, I think this is important, not just for vulnerable populations, but I think one of the things that pandemics exposed, I think for all of us, or certainly for many of us, is the, the real costs of social isolation. And these are real costs. This isn't a nice to have, like social isolation itself is is approximately comparative to a, a habit of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of its its effect on its negative effect on life expectancy and there's other people like eric kleinenberg who's looked at say the chicago heat wave of 1995 and and it was absolutely clear that the people at highest risk of death were in part those people that just didn't have neighbors to check on them so some of this is, is very simple. Intimate friends are really important, but we know, and this is a really strong piece of evidence that we do know, is that as you and I move around our day-to-day -day lives, the quality and character of our very simple contacts, our contact with, with someone making us a cup of coffee, our contact with our neighbors, um, is a really important aspect of quality of life. And I think that, that we're, we're all more vulnerable in that area now, and it's something I really care a lot about. And, and the other way I sometimes frame this is that uh, 
you know, the, the real estate industry, especially so far in my in my view, is often focused on on luxury and privacy as core values. And the reality is luxury and privacy aren't those things that make you happy. The things that are absolutely key to making you happy are your relationships with the people you deal with on a day to day basis. Powerful, powerful. Well, let's talk. Let's dive in there a little bit about sociability because it really comes down to human beings interacting. And I've, I've always thought, I mean, isn't it an incredible opportunity that we have as architects to actually shape the way that people interact? Mm -hmm. We, we do have that opportunity, and, and sometimes I think um, we forget the basics. Um, one of the ways that our, our software is structured is that, that you know, uh, we, we've often had conversations, I'm sure you've had them, if, you know, well, let's increase sociability by adding an amenity room or something like that, right? And those are great, um, but, but it's, it's sometimes it's a bit like the shorthand for solar panels. It's a bit like, oh, let's just do this, and the problem goes away. So one of the things that we're really interested in is, is what I think of as the, what, what are the, the basic physicality of sociability, right? So what we first started to measure was simply opportunity for eye contact, what we now call encounters. And again, because if you don't have that, there's nothing. <laughs> and and um, one of the examples I like to use, we, we were a bit arrogant when we started using, using because we, we now run all our own projects through the software, as a, partially as a way of testing it and exposing problems. It's not perfect yet, I will never say that. We still got a lot of work to do. Um, but we had, for example, we always do comparative analysis. And part of that is that we know that if we have a building in Barcelona versus a building in, in, in uh, Wichita, that the expectations around sociability are going to be different. So we try to control that by always doing comparative analysis rather than saying, this is what's going on, right? Um, and, and one of our fabulous advisors is Dr. Elizabeth Dunn from UBC, who's got an amazing TED Talk that all your listeners should watch. And she's great. She says, it's not important that it's accurate. It's important that it's useful. But I, I went off track there for a moment. Um, the, uh, so we, we were doing this, this relatively small townhouse project, uh, about 35, 40 units. And we did two options. We did many options, but two we modeled. And if you had told me beforehand, I knew that version B was going to be more sociable than version A. Again, just from that measure of you're walking around, you're moving back and forth between your car, you're going to the lobby. Um, that you're just going to have more opportunity for eye contact. We knew that B was going to be better than A. And I would have guessed if you pushed me that B was going to be maybe twice as good. When we modeled it, it turned out to be 10 times better. It was literally an order of magnitude difference with a relatively simple shift in how the basic relationship, in fact, in this context between parking and the units itself worked. So that meant that you were 10 times more likely in the course of your day to meet a neighbor. I actually think that's a great value. That's that's incredible. And how how new or how how deep is this science gone? It seems like how people interact in buildings, especially today, with COVID and social isolation and and feelings of anxiety and suicide and kids wearing masks mm -hmm. and just the entire dynamic changing. How deep is the field? It seems like it could be deep. Is there a lot of research on this kind of building interaction sociability? Surprisingly little that's, that, that are, very little that uses the approach we're taking, which, which is kind of trying to do predictive modeling. Um, again, there's some precedent studies, but one of the fascinating things about this work from just an academic perspective, not my core passion, but this is uh, our, our UBC um, um, psychology um, co-researchers are, are really fascinated by this because we've asked them some questions that they find extremely interesting. And the questions are really about uh, what I, the term I use is the physicality of sociability. So again, this, this basic, so I went to them and said, okay, we want to look at greetings. So if I'm walking around in the street or in my office or, or in, in, in an apartment building, what's the distance? What's the kind of physical distance that I'm likely to, that I'm most likely to say hi to someone or wave at them or whatever? And they laughed. They said they had no idea. And part of it is that this whole issue of the physicality of sociability is really understudied. Um, and some of it is that, that social sciences research has, has often really focused on um, kind of more experiential qualities, you know, um, like take a survey and measure, measure how happy you are and things like that, which is obviously important research. But we just wanted to know we needed, we needed data to feed into the model. Um, 
And part of the reason we use comparative modeling as well is to control for the fact that we don't know everything. Um, so we never say this is what's going to happen in a building once it's built. We always say when we take these two models and compare them, this is what, using the same assumptions, this is the, this is the scale of the difference. Bruce, out of curiosity, there haven't been any studies that you've or other people have done on perhaps spaces where you don't want people to have that sociability and interaction. It hasn't been applied like that, has it? Um, well, yes, actually. One of our, uh, uh, our, 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 our software builder models who are local um, Vancouver-based collaborator called Distance are, are very, very, uh, very thoughtful. One of the things that they immediately pointed out was that this type of approach would be very useful for modeling how people should interact as they move back into an office environment post-pandemic. Because if you think about it, our desire for a kind of sociability bubble in the positive sense about how to how to talk to you know how how, um, um, how to, to trigger conversations between people, the exact opposite is true in a pandemic scenario. You want to have the sociability bubble, so we're able to actually use it at an early stages to start to understand um, you know what would be a hot spot for potential social contact, like a lot of people moving through a comp compressed space. But there's a more interesting one. That's actually a kind of you know, very topical one. Um, we started just having a bunch of conversations with people about this, and part of it is we, we learned something. Um, and we were part of a group uh, um, that we presented to a group who were looking at the redesign of long-term care homes, retirement homes. Um, and, and one of the things that, that they noticed that would be really interesting is, is that, that um, well, they pointed out to us is that, and I think of my own mother who's in, in 96 and has dementia, when you have different kinds of dementia, for example, the, the, your sensitivity to social contact is actually quite different. So some people literally want to be down the hall, away from people, they want to, other people would love to step out and be right in the dining hall. So one of the things that we can do is we can literally model each, you know, we can model a floor plate and say, this unit will be a highly social unit and this unit won't. And some of it, you know, you know, you're an architect, you and I could sit there with colored pencils and figure a lot of this out, to be honest, in terms of that. But what we found is that, that and it's, in, in some ways it's a sad truth, is people believe computers, right? Um, and we are interested in making it actionable. Like our goal, like one of the ways I always think about it, one, one of my goals, I just want people to have more friends. Like, so, so, we, so that, in that case, it has to show up as action. Bruce, how do you take something from the idea you saw a problem, you had the idea, how do you walk me through the process that you went through to not just make this a nice to have, yeah. but obviously yeah. you took some action on it and you did something about it. You moved it forward or some one of your team members moved it forward. Yeah. Walk through me. Yeah. How did you do that? Um, there are many steps. We, we got an initial seed funding from BC Housing to just find out whether anybody had done it before, which is a kind of obvious question. And as far as we, we could tell, we didn't. There's a couple, there's, a, there's an architecture firm in Australia that, that had done a pretty preliminary modeling around offices. There's a lot of work around things like um, fire exiting and, you know, transit stations, you know, those sorts of like high volume ones. Um, and some of that work was applicable, but nobody had actually done what we were trying to achieve. So that was an interesting um, finding. And then, okay, so I'm going to pause you right then, there, Bruce. I'm going to pause you right there. How did you take me back a little farther? How did you how did you get funding? How did you even know that that you could look for funding something like this? I, I you know, the honest truth, you know, I think I got funded because it was really clear that I was passionate about it. To be to be transparent, I just went to people and I said, you know, this is something um, that's that in our view is a real gap. And most times I would tell the story I told about the, the you know, this housing for vulnerable women. And, and people understand the comparison. They understand because many of the people who are interested in this kind of work have been in that kind of scenario where, you, uh, you know, architecture is an expression of so many societal values and the social ones just get sidelined sometimes. So they're talked about in very loose and impract impractical ways. So, um, there was that, but there was a real breakthrough. So, so we got relatively moderate seed funding. And then we really struggled because we didn't know how to fund an actual software build. And then I got lucky because I was at the TED conference. Let me pause you. So, sorry, Bruce, is it okay if I interrupt you a little bit here? I really want to slow things down for our audience. Okay. Um, and okay. for me particularly, because my brain works a little sl slowly. Sorry, I, get, I, I, I apologize, Nick. I get, I get excited about this and I do talk a little slowly. So so no so worries. So this is my job to slow you down Perfect. here and really get the Perfect. juice out because we're getting a lot of juice here. I want to make sure we get every morsel okay. of it. So, okay. you saw, so you saw a problem. 
And then there, there had to have come a moment where you said, you know, I'm going to need some money or some resources yes. to be able to pull yeah. this off. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you're sitting there to make this a reality. I, I'm not going to be able to do it myself. I'm not going to be able to bootstrap it with my, my rich uncle or my, my trust fund. I'm going to need some money to do this. Okay. And then what was the next step? Did you say, okay, I got to pitch this to people. So you're sitting there in your living room somewhere in the studio thinking, you know, I need to get money for this. Walk me through kind of like, how'd you, where'd you go? What, what was your first steps to try to get money for this? Well, the first thing I, I did was talk to people like my friends at Happy City, who's a, an amazing um, local group who, who got in it. And I said, oh, you should talk to BC Housing. And BC Housing is our provincial government agency responsible for delivering affordable housing around the province of British Columbia. And they have a small kind of, um, uh, a, well, a relatively large research group that, that, that does some materials and does have some relatively small pockets of money. So they, and they were, they were excited and interested in this idea because in part, um, there's also evidence that sociability has a financial benefit, right? That, that, for example, it reduces tenant turnover. It tends to reduce things like vandalism. So those are all things that they're, they're very interested in. Um, and then the, the, the big breakthrough, um, was when, so we, we actually took about three years to get some seed funding to just do some homework, right? And we mostly subsidized it, but it enabled, it, it enabled me to kind of look my partner in the eye and say, yeah, I'm working on this and so we're not losing too much money on it. Um, and uh, uh, the big breakthrough was, I was at the TED. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we believe that it's, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still a, a fundamental believer in the idea that architecture should be about the public good. We'd identified a critical challenge and we wanted to just give this gift of trying to solve that challenge. Um, and, uh, uh, and so the, one of the breakthroughs was that I should start, I'm a passionate Canadian. Um, I'm, I'm proud and passionate about being Canadian. Canadians are not always the best at funding innovative ideas. Um, you know, we had a lot of, well, we'll give you $5,000 if you get 10 people to sign off and saying, they will use the software. That's kind of it. Anyway, the breakthrough was, um, uh, I was at the TED conference, which it was in Vancouver locally. And, um, I got pinged for, um, I had on my, it's a good, good example to keep your resume up to date. So they have that kind of internal messaging app and I got pinged by a fabulous character called Eli Parisier. And Eli was one of the people who founded Avaz and move on. And he's very interested in this issue of um, social interaction in the internet and trying to make the internet more like cities. So we had a coffee and, um, uh, and I mentioned this idea to him. He said, this is an interesting idea. You should go to, um, you should talk to the Robert Johnson Foundation who are actually big supporters of TED and have people there. He said, why don't I set up a coffee for you? And so I uh, had a uh, one of the senior leaders, um, Lori Melichar of, of Robert Johnson. I had a coffee with her later that afternoon. And I, Eli said something very funny to me, by the way. He says, he says, don't go all Canadian on me. He says, if you need 100,000, ask for 300,000. <laughs> so, so I laughed and I was kind of nervous. And then, so I went and I, I basically told you some of the early narrative that, 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 I've, that I've shared with, with you. And Lori said, this is an interesting idea. Um, we think this is the kind of idea we might we might like to fund, um, and we went and we went in in negotiations um, with them in discussion, and and you know the goal is it's all we're gonna we're gonna post the software on Gift GitHub the design it's designed to be a tool that any architect can use you know it's fundamentally a public good public good process, and RWJF have been amazing amazing partners in this um, you know they uh, and they ended up giving us six hundred thousand dollars to actually build the software. That's 600,000 Canadian, 450,000 American. And that let us really hire people. You know, we were able to put our own resources into it in a way that made, made financial sense. Um, and we actually were really proud of it. We're very proud of it. It's, it's an incredible story here. And there's, there's so much here. Something you said that really struck me. So some of the, here at Business of Architecture, some of the programs that we run, we run different groups and different programs to help architects, mostly on the practice side of, of running a business, because we really feel that, you know, if we can get the practice humming along, then it's gonna free up the creative side. It's gonna free up endeavors like this, right? Because obviously, if you were stressed out about paying bills or, or dip, you know, coming up with payroll, it'd be very hard, I would think, yeah. to come up with yeah. the mental space to be able to in, innovate like this. So. 
The reason I bring that up is because it's interesting. For some of our group programs, we have communities and we always find what we discover is people come for the content. So they join because they want to get access to certain content, but they stay for the community, meaning they stay for the relationships they build. And when you mentioned, you know, less turnover in buildings, um, you know, keeping tenants for longer, it just seems like there's so much in this field of human interaction that hasn't been tapped or talked about. I, I agree 100%. And, and, and our, our, our tool is only part of the answer. I mean, you know, one of the ways I think about it is we're not even sure if you think of a typical building, let's say it's perfectly modeled for sociability. Like, let's say it works really well, it scores really high by our metrics. Um, that may be inconsequential relative to another building that's much worse designed but has a grandmother in a unit next to the front entry that invites every new tenant over for tea and introduces them to 10 other tenants. You know, There is this real factor of interaction, but I do firmly and passionately believe that physical space can, especially can really get in the way of sociability. You know, and we, we've modeled, for example, um, uh, we're starting to build up a series of models. Just you know, we we keep modeling more and more, more and more buildings. Some of them fun, like uh, we model Pruitt Igo, for example. Um, um, but uh, uh, you know, for, well, it was interesting. It kind of sat in the mid range of the of, of sociability. But part of what we recognized was that. Um, uh, when we look, when we, one of the things we found is that, that high-rise buildings almost always perform dramatically worse. Um, for reasons that were not absolutely clear, we, our guess is that it's simply that the path to your unit is shorter. You know, if you think about going up an elevator versus, say, walking along a longer exterior corridor, so simply that reduces your, just the time, exposure to other people. Yeah, that makes sense. Fascinating. So for those who may not have heard of the pruitt Igo. Um, do you mind just giving sure. the... Sure, Igo was a, a very famous modernist um, uh, uh, housing project in, in, in St. Louis that was designed by Yamasaki, I think. Um, and it was highly controversial and, and, and immediately socially troubled, a lot of crime, and was uh, eventually blown up. And I think my memory is about 1972. There's a famous video online that you can see of them blowing it up. And it was in many in many ways it was seen as kind of the uh, a, a real clear terminus point. This is the end of the modern movements, and the end of, certainly the end of the modern mov movements, um, social utopias. Yeah, and it's interesting. So, have you how much research or how much study has been done on on all the other variables that might go into sociability? Because you mentioned earlier that you know. A, 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 an elderly woman or a grandmotherly figure, you know, can can trump everything yeah. just from that social interaction. So have there been any, have you combined or had the chance to combine what you're learning with any sort of social programs uh, in terms of maybe the building itself where it has some sort of homeowners association or start to involve yeah. more of the social yeah. structure into what you're discovering? Yes. Um, uh, and, and so... Uh, I, I'm I'm a big believer that that you know if you look at how movements develop, it, it's never a single firm. It's it's certainly never a single individual. It's always a cluster, um, and there is an interesting cluster in this part of the world in, in Vancouver uh, around this issue from slightly different lenses. So one is our collaborator, Dr. Elizabeth Dunn, who's who's looked, for example, at, at happiness in a bunch of ways, including kind of financial happiness. Um, uh, there's people like John Hellowell, who help, who's a UBC professor, who's a very senior kind of sociability godfather in this pe part of the world, who, who helps write the World Happiness Report. One of our day-to-day -day collaborators, and we really see a, a positive one, is Happy City, also based here. And Happy City um, has done a lot of research on exactly what they're talking about, the Happy City. But they, they're one of the people that has done, for example, um, you know, they've, they've strapped heart monitors on people and said, what, how do people physiologically respond to different urban environments, for example? So they're very passionate about the issue of evidence-based um, material. Um, there's a collaborative with, associated with the city of Vancouver and Simon Fraser University here called Hey Neighbor. And they've done a whole ton of work on just case studies. And they did this amazing and lovely thing, which is they've um, identified, you know, they, they've hired sort of social concierges for buildings. Like in many cases, recent immigrants, and it's like a hundred bucks a month or something. And just say, your job is to go around and you know you set up the barbecue for Friday nights on in the summer, that sort of stuff. And we're huge believers in this, right? 
And, and some, of the, some of the ways I think about architecture, it's like um, I, one of our jobs is really to set the stage for social interaction, you know, to really, um, and, then, and then to, and, and to recognize, I think, with, with modesty that, that, you know, people are critical, obviously, to social interaction, and that it, we want architecture to, to help people do the job properly. That's beautiful. Uh, Bruce, if you could help me understand a bit about the process of getting the software off the ground. So you, I want to go back because you get, you get the funding, you got the incredible grant where suddenly it opened up yep. a whole new level yep. of possibility. Now you have the problem of, I have a lot of money. What the heck are we going to do with all this money? How do we, I mean, there is sort of a problem there. How do we use it wisely? Yep. How, what are the connections yep. to, I don't know. I'm not in the software world. How do I do that? Like kind of, can you walk us through the Reader's Digest version of how you walk through that process? Sure. Well, first of all, what, what we did is we, 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 we were in a very interesting position of being clients for a creative process, which, you know, often we're on the other side. So that was great. So we put out a, a request for proposals. Um, and so we had a, a series, you know, we, in the process of doing our preliminary research, we talked to people who were doing analogous things. For example, Arup, the large scale global engineering firm, has a software called Mass Motion that does kind of the, the larger scale human modeling, for example. So we wanted them to submit a proposal. Um, and what was, uh, and then in the end, we had four, we got four submissions for that. And we structured the proposal quite carefully again, because I'd, I'd had to respond to so many awful proposals and uh, that uh, proposal calls that, that I want to be quite careful. And part of what we we're looking for, um, you know, we tried to set the stage that people could give, you know, could bring their best game to it, right? You know, we didn't try to make it a checklist proposal. And I also had a great group of advisors, because I'm not a software expert, so we had a group of about 10 advisors, including Dr. Dunn, and people who had just different areas of expertise, including software. Um, and um, so we did, we, we, we rapidly shifted it from four to two based on interviews. And it was great, by the way, I've, as someone who's done a lot of interviews, it was great to be on either side of interviews. Um, so uh, for example, at least make sure you're not looking for documents in the middle of the screen, which was one of the things that happened. I won't tell you who that was. And it came down to a very interesting pairing, which was Arup, very large global international firm, and a grouping of three individuals who are all Vancouver based who had come together because we'd been renting space to one of them, and he overheard a conversation about this and said, I think we can help. So he put together, he's a software guy by training, and he put together a little team to, to chase this. And at first, the, when we did the first round of interviews, our, our advisors all said, just give it to Arab. They'll get the job done. They're amazing. You know, they've got that clout. And again, because I'd been there and I've been part of a very large architecture practice, I'm now a small size, I said, I'm not, um, I don't want this to be just a credential selection. Like I want, and, and so I said, let's give them each a little bit of money. We'll give them like three months to run with it and just see how they do. And Arup is a fabulously talented firm, right? A fabulous, and they were, they were really, really um, um, on their game. They had lot, bought a lot of firepower to the problem. But in the end, when we went through the second round of interviews, it was absolutely unanimous to give it to the small local collaborative. Fundamentally, it was an issue of passion. They cared about it. We knew, and they, and they, this this group distance, and it's the it's um, um, three of them. They're just, they have just done an amazing job to really take. They've actually taken the software far beyond where we our original goals were. Um, so, and, uh, and we're still, we anticipate collaborating with them for a long time to get the software better and better and expand it to other uses. What's your vision here? Where, would, where do you see this going? Well, our goal is to do many different things. Um, one is, just to be clear, that, that any architect can go to our, our Fluid website and sign up and start using the software today. Like, um, we are going through a, a, a validation process working with UBC because we have to make sure that, you know, that one of the risks, we don't want to overpromise. Um, um, we do think it's, it's really useful to have different people using, using it to, to be able to test it. Like, tell us what the user, you know, you know it's like all of the, uh, you, can't, you can't test your own software, right? Because it's, it's in your own brain. Um, so we're, we're doing a, a series of testing, but we also want to start doing this process of modeling real buildings and surveying residents to see how they align. Um, and COVID, to be honest, has caused us some challenges in that in a bunch of ways, both logistically and just because social interaction is, a, is different than it used to be. Um, so that's a stage. 
Um, we're looking for the ne for the next block of funding. For example, we we want to fund a nonprofit, and some of it is that it's absolutely um, from our from our firm. It's great branding and all of these kinds of things, but our critical goal is 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 impact for the public good. And we've had interesting feedback, by the way, that that there's a couple of people who've seen the software in the kind of tech world and said, just patent the hell out of it and you know get it big and then sell it, you know. And we made a conscious decision not to do that. And, and we actually believe that the, the highest value both to the world and to ourselves is if we're generous with it. You know, that, uh, that we think that that'll be the, the best public good and we get as many people out there using it as possible. Um, so, so part of it is, is doing things, to be honest, like having conversations with you, like getting, expanding the, expanding the word out, um, testing it, um, presenting at conferences. And, and we want to really engage as well. Um, I am a believer that um, architects can have individual passions, but when, um, and I love talking to other architects and I want to hear what they care about. But if you look at the way our business has shifted in terms of what are the fundamental rules of the game, it's usually been outside pressures. It's been environmental sustainability or political pressures or the building code in terms of the real guts of how we do things. Um, so we want to engage much more, and we're working with this on the, with the public health community, like like I mentioned, the group doing long-term care homes. Those kind of conversations are really important because, in my view, they they always set the context of purpose. Right? We want the world to be a healthier place. One of the things that's broken in the world is social interaction. This is a tiny part of that equation. It's not the whole thing. It's a tiny part, but it's not an inconsequential part. And it's one that's underbaked. Bruce, we'd love to take this conversation deeper, and I definitely like to have you back on in a couple of years to see how this plays out. Thank you for coming on and sharing with us about this remarkable, uh, remarkable opportunity and innovation that that you're part of. And and you probably you don't do you don't do consulting, do you, with other firms, other firms that may hear this, developers, people who might want to bring you in as a consultant? Do you do that kind of thing? No, we we absolutely do that, and in in, in some cases we've got a a collaborative consultative relationship with the affordable housing department in the city of Calgary. Um, we're in discussions with a, with a Quadrio, which is a very large Canadian-based developer that does work all over the world, and our goal there is to really partner with them to to help them support the development of the software and kind of um, give them uh, give them more of an inside track on how to use it use it most effectively. Um, yeah, we're, we're really enthusiastic about that. Our goal again is to get as many people as possible using it. We, we get and respect that for a while we may need to be the entry point. Beautiful. Bruce Hayden, thank you for being with us and sharing with us today your journey on the business of architecture. Nick, I'm so grateful for your time. And that is a wrap. I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with Bruce Hayden talking about how he has innovated in the area of architecture by taking an idea, bringing it to market, and adding a valuable contribution to how we exist as human beings. I hope you're inspired by his story, and perhaps you have a similar idea, and maybe this is just the catalyst that you need to take action on that idea. Today's episode, of course, is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture step-by-step -step training program for firm owners where we walk with you to help you develop a practice that gives you freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Because you see what we found is that generally, it isn't your architecture or design skills that is likely holding you back. It's gonna be the business aspects of design, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money, dealing with client changes, dealing with planning authorities, all the other stuff that needs to happen to be able to make the architecture happen. Well, if you're ready to leave the old way of practicing architecture, and if you're looking for the new opportunity of actually running a smart practice to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to get an overview of the proven simple and easy to implement smart practice method that we've spent the past decade developing, spending over $4.7 million in the development of this, and help you run a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. And if you feel like there might be a fit, we'd love to have us brief chat with you, and we can see if there might be the opportunity for us to collaborate and work together. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment 
except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.